talk about um, sustainable development. So this is the idea um, of how to do development, for instance, in poverty while uh, respecting the environment. And uh, this is a really uh, becoming a tricky issue, as it turns out. Um, and uh, so sustainable development is most often defined um, via the Brundtland Commission. And uh, it says that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay. In other words, let's not use up so much of their resources so that your, your grandkids or great-grandkids can't live the kind of life we live. Okay. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is... Uh, becoming more and more of a pressing matter. Um, you hear about it in the news all the time. Um, we're going to try to pr frame this in a scientific way. Um, and then um, later we'll, in other lectures, we'll cover other aspects of this issue. Um, Jeffrey Sachs, um, he's one of the, he's a, really a top economist who we're going to talk about his perspectives on development a little later um, in class. Um, it says there's three key components of sustainable development. There's economic development, social inclusion, which me it basically means how you address inequalities, okay, and then environmental sustainability. So, um, so why does he include the middle one? Well, the reason is, is that, you know, if you think about people like China and Rosa, um, Chino and Rosa, when they're living at that level of poverty, most often they are not polluting much or using much resources. Nowhere near as much as you or I use, okay? And uh, this creates a, a very uh, significant concern because on the one hand, of course, we want to help Chino and Rosa. On the other hand, if we help them too much, maybe they'll start behaving like us and then if ever, all, all the poor of the world behave like us, we'd be in deep doo-doo in terms of ruining the environment. So how do you solve that quandary, especially with growing population sizes and so forth? So um, we'll, we'll get to that more. In particular, in le later on, we're going to be talking about the social justice perspectives, and, you know, sort of what's fair type of issues. Um, and then development. We'll set some of this uh, sustainable development in the context of development. Um, and then sort of on the ground engineering will make this very tangible. We'll be talking about sustainable design for technology. How do you go about that? How do you make sure that you use materials that aren't ruining the environment? The operation of your technology doesn't destroy the environment. You're recycling, you're, you, everything's easy to recycle so that at end of life, your product doesn't ruin the environment. We'll be talking about all that later on. Okay, so today we're gonna frame the problem in terms of explaining um, two broad things, pollution, We'll discuss some about impacts on health, and then we'll um, talk about the, um, the issue of the relationship between uh, development, the way we've talked about it so far in terms of poverty reduction, and uh, sustainable development. We'll do that at the end of the lecture. Okay? So to start out, assuming my technology all works here, we're going to watch a little movie. Um, the presence or introduction into the environment of a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects on the environment. And even us, pollution comes in a variety of different ways. It may come in the water, in the land. It worked last time. Or even in the air. There are also two others, much less well known, light pollution and noise pollution. However, those are not the worst of our problems. Pollution can ruin our can, own can you hear it that? Prevent plants I'm sorry, I don't know why this sound isn't coming on. See, the speakers up here. Start with a very dangerous, but little known. You might have to change the output in your settings. Of pollution. Oh, just a minute, though. I, I, I see. I can see why it wouldn't work, though, because. I'm only using the VGA. Yeah, that's it. Um, well, the 
presence or introduction into the environment of a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects on the environment. And even us. Pollution comes in a variety of different ways. You. It may come in the water, in the land, or even in the air. There are also two others, much less well known, like pollution and noise pollution. However, those are not the worst of our problems. Pollution can ruin our ozone layer, Thanks. it can prevent plants from growing, and even kill our animals. Let us start with a very dangerous, but little known form of pollution now, the dangers of land pollution. Land pollution can be formed through many ways including industrial activities, domestic waste, and agricultural activities. Land pollution is caused not just by landfills and domestic waste, but also by many other things including the deforestation, which is the cutting down of trees, industrial wastes, such as nuclear substances, mining, and even some forms of mechanization. Domestic wastes, including landfills, can be a huge problem. Domestic waste is the buildup of home garbage in a certain place. They are of a huge threat to the public. Landfills will attract detrivores and decomposers, which are in some cases not good for the environment. These detrivores can include mice, voles, seagulls, and other nasty beings. Despite all the problems posed by land pollution, that is not the least of our problems. One serious problem posed by us would be the introduction of water pollution. Water pollution is not something that only comes from one source. It comes from many, and those include wastewaters, sewage, marine dumping, and industrial pollution which includes oil pollution. Wastewaters are very dangerous, both for your health and the health of your ecosystems. Sewage would include all feces, urine and other toxic wastes. If this waste is not treated though, the bacteria will escape, causing the spread of diseases and impurification of water, leading animals to die. When chemicals are in the water, they will cause immense damage to other nearby ecosystems. This type of water is referred to as brown sludge. On the other hand there is also a huge issue, called coastal or marine dumping. When substances are dumped into our water bodies, it will be known as marine dumping. No information about this was kept before the 1990s. Any object could potentially be dumped into water. These may include oil, plastics and other objects. Oil, however, is one that is very dangerous for the health of our ecosystems. Oil takes a long time to be broken down naturally, and moves quickly throughout the seas. One prime example of this inaction would be the famous BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, as shown here. In case, British Petroleum has sent seven oil spillage cleanup vessels in order to deal with any potential pollution. Katie? Under the Bay Singles Bridge. So, you see it. I mean, it, it's raining oil. Another type of dumping is the dumping of chemicals. If there is too much alkaline in the water, then animals can't survive at that pH level. Indeed, they will die. One other huge method of water pollution would be the dumping of plastics and other objects. These objects choke and will kill over 100,000 marine animals each year. Some beaches may even contain so many pollutants that it can become an animal graveyard. However, aside from the beaches, there is one place where this is definitely present, in the Pacific trash vortexes. Each one of the two is almost twice as big as Texas, and is only growing larger. These two garbage patches are connected by a string of trash, called a 6,000 mile long convergence zone. There are vortexes in every major sea or ocean. But did you also know that there is air pollution? <coughs> it becomes polluted when noxious gases or black carbon particulates are released into the air. There are three main gases that cause air pollution. These are sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides. Sulfur dioxide occurs mainly when polar oil are burned in power plants. This gas is also commonly found in smokestacks, as shown here. Carbon monoxide is caused mainly by gasoline equipment. Others are aircraft, diesel and railroads. Carbon monoxide is much like carbon dioxide, meaning that it is a harmful greenhouse gas. Nitrogen oxides only occur at higher temperatures. It facilitates and causes acid rain. It is known to cause eutrophication. It is caused, again, by transportation vehicles and power plants. Now to move on. A brief overview of black carbon pollution. This phenomenon may account for 18% of the world's global warming. It causes soupy brown air. This is only used to describe industrial particulate pollution. 
Did you know that nature creates its own pollution too? Volcanoes spew ash into the atmosphere, providing a stream of sulfur dioxide. The acid reacts with sunlight, and blocks it. Sort of like what happened on Mount Pinatubo. And over towns and farmlands, killing more than 300 people. Wind storms can also pick up dirt, and place it in the atmosphere. Forest fires can create industrial-sized smog, and can release carbon from the trees into the atmosphere. <laughs> Organic matter dies, and when they do, they will release their carbon into the atmosphere. Also, when warmed, our oceans will release some of the carbon they have stored causing natural pollution. Please note that this was all under regulation before the arrival of humans. If not for us, pollution would not be a problem. Pollution also has negative effects on our ecosystems. Amphibians are hit hardest by water pollution. They absorb water through their skin, so any toxins present get directly inside their bodies. Insects will no longer be able to glide on water, due to the amount of pollution in the form of debris, or oils, in a land ecosystem. When chemicals seep into the ground, plants may be tainted, and will not be able to perform core functions. It's about time that you face the facts. We must do something about pollution. Pollution is bad for our health. It kills millions of people each year who get heart disease. Lead poisoning. And even some lung problems. And furthermore, 40% of America's rivers are too polluted from fishing, swimming or aquatic life. What can we do to help this growing problem? We can recycle, plant a tree, get better fuel efficient cars, or even contact our local authorities and governments to raise awareness, and put in place plans to make our community a cleaner, ecological place. We had just passed over uh, the development uh, in uh, northern Alberta of uh, the tar sands. Pollution affects us through the air, the land, and the waters. This is something we must be aware of as we proceed into a hopefully greener future. So this is a good day. It's a good day in the fight for cleaner air. Here's another one. <coughs> America, it's time for a gut check. If the founding they fathers saw it. us huddled in our little... One day, we will wake up to find that the energy that powers the alarm clock came from the breeze through the trees the night before. And we will go to work that morning riding the rays of the sun. It will light our cities and power <coughs> our businesses. It will warm our homes and cool our workplaces. It will reduce sources of conflict and fuel our economies. It will connect us all. It won't scar the land or poison the seas. The food we eat will be good for our bodies and good for the planet. And the weather that day won't make us worry for tomorrow. There will be more jobs and less disease. The sea level will stop rising. And species will stop dying. The question is, how do we get to that day from where we are today? All 7.3 billion of us. We start by deciding that beyond our doubts and differences, such a day truly exists. And that is something each of us can do today. We can make today the day we stop thinking that the changes required to get there are impossible and beyond us and start realizing that they are not only possible, but what the future requires of us. We must stop turning from the warnings of science and fear and denial and instead turn toward the solutions and partnerships we need. We can make today the day we stop pointing at each other in blame and instead chart a new course together.
We have never faced a crisis this big, but we have never had a better opportunity to solve it. We have everything we need to wake up to a different kind of world. We need our leaders to be brave and their choices to be bold. They will either remember us as the generation that destroyed its home or the one that finally came to respect it. We have every reason <coughs> in the world to act. We can't wait until <coughs> tomorrow. This is our only home. You can choose today to make a world of difference. Ah, <coughs> uh, comments. <clears throat> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I watched the uh, Poor America BBC video. Yeah. And one of the main things about that video was there's a disagreement about, in America at least, uh, whether or not poor in America are really poor and whether it's a problem or not. I think the biggest thing with uh, the environmental pollution too is, and it's a lot of times it's a little on political boundaries, some people deny there's even a problem and other people think it's a crisis and there's there's not even any common middle ground. Yeah, there's, supposed to a problem. there's a large polarization in the United States right now. Um, the, the people who have studied it say that we're more polar, polarized than since the Civil War. Uh, this is a very unusual situation we're in. Uh, with respect to uh, the poverty issue, every time I hear this stuff, I think it's, it's, it, all of it, it comes down to ignorance. Uh, people that are very wealthy and live in their gated communities, big homes, that don't understand. That's, that's what it comes down to. And number one, and it also comes down to the, it's not in their interest to understand. Because if you do understand, then you may feel you have to do something about it, and that might take money out of your pocket because of income redistribution. But this is a tough issue. Everybody knows there's poor people that rip off the system. Everybody knows that. The question is, how much of that's going on? Nobody seems to know that. Number two, um, you can go look up, look up the term uh, corporate welfare. Far, far more money is given to large, rich corporations than to the poor in this country. So, because why? Well, they have political clout. So I think we have to be careful about this whole redistribution thing. I think a lot of people that talk about don't take my money, don't tax me at higher rate, aren't really looking at what they're getting, you know. <coughs> now with respect to the environment, you know, that one I have, a, it's another fundamental problem of ignorance. See, I mean, um, with respect to the scientists, there's almost a complete uniformity of voice on this issue. And then they find one scientist who doesn't agree, or he might or she might just slightly agree with one issue. They distort their view, okay, and then say, see, not everybody agrees with it. And that's, that's simply absurd, okay? But why would they be interested in doing that? Because you understand that this is a really a fundamental issue. Because if it is in fact the case that the wealthy are polluting a lot more than the poor, then we're talking about it. It's not just money now. It's basic resource use. And how do you redistribute that resource use? Because we all know we need resources like oil <coughs> in order to drive the economic en engine so that I can get rich. So I think we have to question, when I listen to these people, I question, well, where's their perspective really coming from? And I, a lot of the times, I think it's coming from them protecting themselves, unfortunately. And th see, the problem is, don't get me as a rich person hater either. That's absurd, too. Because there are extremely wealthy people in the world that are doing incredibly great things for the world. I think we can all name them. Name one. Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Fantastic example. Warren Buffett, actually, is a very good example. And there's others. So, you know, I don't think it's appropriate to have a, 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 some kind of a view that the rich are bad, the poor are good, the poor are bad, and the rich are good. There are individuals that, along all these spectra, that do good and bad. 
And, uh, but I, I do like to think about it as in terms of what's in people's best interest. So the poor, you know, of course, they want to get more goodies, so they, they want taxation such that it will be in their benefit. Okay, but not all poor feel that way. Uh-uh. Uh, people I've talked to that are poor, they hate being on that. They hate using anything from the government. And they avoid it at all costs, try to get off as soon as possible. That's the normal pattern. You know, the pattern, you know, the, the welfare queen, this was discussed in the 90s with Bill Clinton when the welfare system was changed in this country. You know, okay, some of that was going on, but was it predominant? I don't know. I'm not sure that was the case. So, and I, I'm not sure, you know, in the past 10 years, the climate deniers have been going away. They've been going away a lot. There's been some big shifts in this country. Um, you're not seeing, at one point it was a, a sizable group. It's, it's really dwindling. They're, they're getting less um, vocal because if you just look at the data and the science, it's, it's like obvious, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that they denied the world was even getting warmer. Yeah. Now they're admitting that it's getting warmer, but they're not. They're, they're not, well, the, it's not our fault. So it's not the human's fault, it's, it's whatever. Yeah, so look, I mean, these are very complicated issues. These, these, issues, these issues really piss people off, I'll tell you what. You can tell already I'm not afraid of pissing people off. <laughs> no, but I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I want people to look at things in a careful way. And if we don't know, let's just admit we don't know, rather than taking some pos random position. That's all. So uh, I, I have a lot more detail in my book on these issues, but uh, here's a list of... Uh, typical air pollutants, um, there's ozone ground level and um, in the atmosphere. Um, ozone protects us from ultraviolet rays from the sun, which causes all kinds of nasty cancer and so forth. There's all kinds of particulate matter from, from combustion, etc. carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, they talked about in the movie, and then the greenhouse gases in that order, okay? Um, the climate change issue is, is quite a significant one, of course. Uh, ones in the U.S., the largest from the U.S. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, our largest emitters of greenhouse gases by the economic sector are electricity, transportation industry, commercial, residential, and agricultural. Okay, um, why electricity? Well, it's it's a lot of it's coal-fired power plants. You know, I mean, let's not. You know, you can. We're in Ohio. <laughs> it is like heresy to say coal is bad in Ohio, right? Sorry, but it is, you know? It pollutes a lot. The whole Midwest is spewing pollution from coal. I'm not saying I know there's a better solution. I'm just saying let's admit there's a problem. Then they start talking about clean coal. Okay, but impacts on climate change. What will happen is climate change. There's gonna be an increase or decrease rainfall Effects on agricultural crop yields, adverse ones, effects on human health, changes to ecosystems. I got some great website here if you want to get into the human health. It's myriad things for human health, okay? Um, changes to ecosystem, including adverse effects on biodiversity. We'll come back to that in a minute. The biodiversity issue is actually one of the biggest issues right now in the world. Um, coming to global warming that you just brought up, um, this is from NASA. So let's look at this uh, plot. Um, world map, obviously. So these are surface temperatures in 2013 compared to 1951 to 1980. And then in the middle, the white regions have changed by no more than 0.2 degrees. I, uh, gee, I'm sure it's degrees C. These are scientists doing this. Not Americans, no, I'm kidding. Um, there, there's degree C, I'm sure. And uh, so blue areas, it, temperature's gone down. Red and dark red areas, our temperature's gone up. What's interesting about this plot, so you see this over Russia, this big place where it's heated up on Siberia. I mean, wow. Northern Africa, Brazil, Australia's gone up a lot. But the United States, big chunk, not changed at all. Right where we're at, right? Right where we're at, that white region. In fact, just north and um, west of the Great Lakes, you got a slightly blue region, so it's gone down a little bit. So the whole thing's mixed, all right? Um, 
But on average, um, there, uh, scientists argue about exact numbers, but you know they say that the the, um, the warming you know is is around a degree or so, and uh, they've looked at this so many different ways. I mean, it, it's indisputable that we have global warming. What's in dispute is what's causing it. Um, water pollution. Well, you saw it in the movie too. You know, industrial mining, landfills, radioactive waste, marine dumping, fertilizers, pesticides. You know, I think one of the problems here though is, is you people don't experience pollution much. You know, when I was putting this lecture together, I was thinking, I'm not really seeing it in Ohio, right? Not really. We're, we're breathing clean air. We drive around, we don't see a lot of trash. We don't experience much water pollution. Well, why? Because the EPA is in place. What was going on in the 70s in Lake Erie? Cuyahoga River. Cuyahoga River. River caught on fire. Shocking, huh? Ruined the reputation of Cleveland for 50 years, I'm sure. Right? It's terrible. What's that? Amongst other things. <laughs> oh, no, come on. <laughs> You, are you from there? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, so, so look, I mean, we had some serious problems with the Great Lakes. There's been a lot of efforts to clean up. But what happened last year? Lake Erie. Algae bloom. Destroyed the water purity for Toledo. I mean, my own brother living up there is a big problem. That's due to pollution, okay? That's not just like some random event. So uh, it's still going on. We still have issues. There's just not like much in Columbus, apparently. Um, I don't like saying that because, of course, climate affects everybody everywhere, okay? But I think you know what I'm saying. Uh, soil pollution, of course, from all, all these different uh, um, activities um, from humans or whatever. Um, so, let's talk about uh, one of the fundamental ideas in uh, ecology and the environment. That's the tragedy of the commons. So imagine, um, to explain the tragedy, I'm going to use the example that Garrett Hardin used originally in his paper in 1968. Um, the tragedy goes like this. Let's say you have a pasture, a cow pasture. It's in the center of an area and everybody can go and put their cow there to graze, feed themselves. So one farmer puts a cow there. He's doing good, gets his, his food, he's able to sell his cow, he's making money, he's getting a good living. Everybody else says, hey, I'm gonna put my cow there. And everybody starts putting their cows there, guess what? It destroys the commons. It, it will, it's, I think it's obvious because every naturally human beings are gonna try to use a common resources for free to get something back that's good for them. It's like free money, essentially. Okay, so this is called the tragedy of the commons. It's been studied in many ways. It is tragedy of an unmanaged commons. Okay, we're gonna be talking about this, but this concept's been extended to many other things, virtually all, all common things. We have common things like what we commonly breathe, and air in this room is a commons. Water like the oceans, rivers and so forth, these are commons. Typically, soil is typically a common, water, so on and so forth, okay? So the question is, is will we have this problem if we don't manage our commons, will we destroy the commons? Especially in the face of population growth, okay? Um, so the best scientific information on this um, is this idea of planetary boundaries. These are limits beyond which the earth cannot support. Um, so this information was recently updated, but I'm going to go with a little bit older paper. Um, so what we have here is um, this over imposed on top of the earth, around the edges you see different things like climate change, ocean acidification, ozone depletion, la la la, all the way around, okay? Now the, the red bars coming out from the center are areas of concern where if the red bar is coming further and further out, it means there's a bigger and bigger concern. We are going beyond the boundary. Going beyond the boundary means you go beyond the light blue, okay? So let's look at the worst things. What they're 
they're saying that biodiversity loss and the nitrogen cycle are the two worst things that have happened. Biodiversity loss obviously means we're killing off species at a too high of a rate, okay? And, you know, this one, at first, this is another one that's hard to see because we don't like see the last whatever die in front of our eyes, right? But when you talk to um, ecologists, uh, I have a really good friend, um, Tom Waite, who's an ecologist, he, he, he studies the whole environment thing. He says, the key issue is biodiversity because once you destroy the last one of a species, it's gone forever. We can't fix it. It's done. So uh, this is quite a significant problem. The second thing here is nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen cycle, if you look it up, is very complex. I mean, 78% of, of the climate, our climate is nitrogen, actually. We always think, oh, it's oxygen. No, it's nitrogen. 78%. Uh, and then we got all kinds of nitrogen things going through water and soil, and it, it cycles. And things that hurt this cycling are things like combustion engines, the fertilizers that are used all over the place. Um, and we've disrupted this cycle significantly, scientists say. We're beyond the boundary now. Okay. Now, you look at the other thing. Uh, climate change is quite up there. Um, and this is why, you know, you, you, there was the recent event in Peru. They're trying to get agreements, okay? Next, they're going to Paris um, and uh, to try to work together to manage the commons. That's what it's about, okay? And uh, this is very difficult. One of the fundamental trade-offs is this. The developing countries look at the U.S. and Europe and say, you guys created this problem. You fix it. Industrial Revolution. Started in England, right? 1800s. In a certain sense, they've got a point. You've been living fat and happy all these years. You fixed the problem. You created the problem. On the other hand, we say, yeah, but if you've got a billion people in your country and you don't also help fix the problem, we're all done, too. So there's a very big trade-off in this inequality and in the history. And oh, my goodness, what a battle. And then everybody knows we have to do something. We have to find some kind of compromise. Okay, let's talk in some detail about planetary boundaries. So, climate change, global warming, many effects on food supply, biodiversity, storms, rising ocean levels, uh, acidification that threatens marine life, ozone depletion, there's the big hole that has been growing above Antarctica, um, and uh, which a lot of people are worried about, you know, but we made progress on that one. They, they uh, outlawed many years ago the use of um, um, the chlorofluorocarbons for refrigerants, and, uh, you know, that was really good. Worldwide came up with that um, agreement, okay? Um, next, this one I found fascinating. So they say that pollution from nitrogen and phosphorus via chemical fertilizers in agriculture. Four billion people in the world are fed as a result of fertilizers. Wow, mind-blowing. I mean, do you understand the implications of what that is? That's over half the people in the world couldn't be here if it weren't for fertilizer. Ooh, wow. But guess what? It's polluting. And the scale of this thing is really big. Overuse of fresh water. Hey, we're lucky in Ohio we got this little drink, this big eerie thing up north of us that could serve us very well in the future. Um, groundwater depletions is a problem in many places. Uh, people realize, you know, there's a lot of water underground in the aquifers that can be drained. Okay, so for instance, these fill up from rain, runoff from rain that goes down into the earth. And, um, but in some countries, they actually use up the aquifer or use it up fast. Um, yeah, land use due to agriculture, forestry, and expansion of cities. Um, yeah, biodiversity, of course, okay, big issue. Um, aerosol loading due to burning coal, um, biomass, and diesel, um, and, the, and then the particulate matter that is, results from that um, is sometimes called aerosols, and then chemical pollution due to industry. Okay, now, here's the thing. We want to come up with a way to relate all those pollution problems more directly to us in our use, okay? So, um, there's the notion of the ecological footprint. Now, the footprint 
is a measure of humans' demands on nature in terms of resource consumption and waste production. And the question is, can the biocapacity of Earth support all human activities? Okay, so my friend Tom Waite um, was, felt this was extremely important. So he tried to minimize his footprint. So what do you do to, min to really minimize your footprint? You never drive a car. He drove, he drove a bicycle everywhere. Rain, snow, sleet, shine, everywhere. Hundreds and thousands of miles everywhere, okay? Um, you dig up your front yard, your yard and plant a garden, period. You put solar panels all over the top of your roof. I mean, there's many, many things that you can do, okay? He seemed to do them all. Um, so, when, if, if we all did that, things would change a lot. You know, they say the easiest way to solve the whole, the climate and the energy problem is if we behave differently in, in the conservation. There's tons and tons of waste, but it, changing human behavior is really, really hard. So, um, what we're gonna start looking at here, remember the Human Development Index? It had three components. It had health, education and income and remember hdi is going up for most countries and going down for a few okay now this uh this uh it, the claim here is right now it takes one and a half planets to support the current activity on the face of the earth and then there's we're eating into it we're destroying it right now okay there's, there's a basic, you gotta understand, in, environment has a replenishment rate. We can pollute some. The, the, for many, many things, it will recycle and rejuvenate and fix your pollution. You say, what? Well, for instance, when, when, when water goes through the soil, it gets filtered, and then we drink it. Okay, so there's a lot of natural replenishment processes. The problem is, is we're, we've overwhelmed those processes. So it takes 1.5 planets right now. Each person needs what's called a 1.8 global hectares um, to support each person. Okay, so I know in the US at least people think in acres. Um, there's 2.4 acres in a hectare, okay? And uh, a global one simply means you're gonna think of splitting the earth up into little patches, but that's not really accurate because Let's, let's kind of split it up in a different way and include some of the ocean, include some of the land and whatever. Okay, so just, it's not as simple as it sounds. Now, let's say we wanted everybody in the world to have an HD, live in a country with an HDI above 0 0.8. Now remember, HDI goes from zero to one. Developed countries are all above 0.8. So just think, you know, the developed world. Okay, now, there's a problem with this. So let's look at what the problem is. So this is the Global uh, Footprint Network. Um, this lady here runs it. Um, this is the problem, this little movie. Okay, I'm sorry, it doesn't allow me to expand the movie. I'll play it over and over though. So it, it, here's what the movie does. You notice on the horizontal axis, we have the United Nations Human Development Index. So it goes from zero up to one. Okay. On the vertical axis, this is the ec ecological footprint in um, hectares per person. <coughs> Here's the thing. They do their analysis, they say, we can't use over 1.8 per person. Forget about population growth for a minute, just go with it. Okay, that means that whatever I do, I want to stay below this line. But I don't want, I don't want any poor people in the world, so I want to stay above this line. So that means the goal area is right here, the little light blue area, okay? Now, the, now comes the depressing part. So this thing is going to play from 1980 to 2007, and you're going to, see, you're going to notice some patterns, okay? And you're, these are countries. Um, now, let's play it once. What's happening? Everybody's going to the right pretty much. 
but everybody's going up too. Nobody is hitting the goal over that time period. Nobody, no country. Now, that's really problematic. Let me point out that um, now if you want, we're gonna watch it again, but now Africa is the orange, Asia, Pacific, see a dark red, green, Europe, Latin America, light blue, dark blue, Middle East and Central Asia, and then North, North America on the deep red. Let's play it again. So it's interesting. I mean, it, it, the pattern is fascinating because, I mean, people in the developed world, I mean, it looks hopeless. We're way, way over. The people in the developing world, however, are making quite a bit of progress without jumping over that line. Do you, do you see that? Focus on Africa and these down here on the bottom. Watch, watch what's happening. They're going up, some of them are just moving to the right. You see that? If they're not. Do you think that's because of just foreign aid, just money being given to them for food and for development rather than them developing our own technologies that, that use up that global I, I, I don't know. I think your answer is really hard. to. That's a great question. I think it's very hard to answer the question. If you look at, uh, let me pick a country to get, illustrate the point. India historically has gotten virtually no aid. Virtually no aid, it's shocking. So, it wouldn't be for their case. Uh, I don't know what the, and then it's hard to count too because you gotta look at what, the, what has happened with the aid. If you're a dictator in Africa, you manage to get a bunch of aid, you leave, take all your money with you, they're burdened with the debt, so how much, and then they're paying off their debt, so it's negative, they're paying more. See the problem? I, I don't, I don't, that's a really hard thing to answer, actually. Yes? It could be. I mean, HDI is education, life expectancy, and something else. So, like, if somebody improves access to education, say, in Africa, they're going to move to the right and probably won't affect their ecological footprint very much. True. So it could be, I mean, that kind of shape of the graph. That could be. The natural shape of it, you get to go along this way, and then you start going up as you improve. Yeah, in other words, you might, I, I agree. In other words, your education health might improve, move your HDI up. When you enable yourself with education and health, you start growing economically, and then we screw everything up. So there's two Latin American countries that are moving down and to the right from my perspective. You see the one that just passed it up at the top there? Do, can, like, can we find out what those countries are and like, what they're doing? Or what they yeah, do? it's Uruguay. Okay. See, you just, so, that, that, see what I'm doing? I'm just putting my cursor. Yeah. So okay. do we know like what those countries are doing and why those are actually lowering their ecological footprint? Because they're still increasing their HDI. I'd like to know the same thing. Uh, maybe my one PhD student, Ugo, is from Paraguay. He might know um, if uh, why that's the case. I, I don't know why that's the case. Could be something as simple as a promotional campaign on TV. Seriously. And, you know, we live in, I think a lot of people don't understand that every culture has a different environment of values and emphasis. Like in, in Costa Rica, I mean, the environment is everything. It, it, it's sort of big influence on their way of thinking. We're not like that here. I don't know the answer to that yet. Anything else? Okay, so, so this, is a, this is sort of a cautionary tale, I think. And, you know... I don't like it, and so, I mean, it only goes up to 2007, but you know, that's that's seven or eight years old. But I think the I was surprised it wasn't updated. Um, but I think it tells us something about the concerns. This gives this quant. I like this because it quantified for me the dynamics of where the world's going in relation to these two key variables. You can argue about whether HDI is the best way to measure development. You can argue about whether um, ecological footprint is the best way to measure environmental impact. Okay, okay, fine. But I think relating those two is really of fundamental importance so we can understand those. I haven't been able to find a better illustration. 
I would like to see a relationship be actually though between planetary boundaries and maybe HDI or MPI. Yes. Has the population in Latin American countries gone down? In no. Past? No. Okay. I I know I, I think there is there like one uh, there's only one or two um, countries on Earth whose population is going down. Um, can somebody name them? China. Where? China. China? Yeah. No. That's that's why they have changed their policy and now. Now they're still going up. Japan. Japan going down? I thought they had a negative birth rate. They might. Italy. Yeah. Italy. Okay. There's very few. Everybody's going up. I mean, okay. Um, next. So, question. Can we end poverty without destroying the planet? Now, this is the key question that's helping formulate the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Uh, they're being developed now. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be released in 2015. Any time now. Um, they didn't make it out in time for my lecture. So uh, there's a, Jeffrey Sachs runs a, a Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and uh, they worked as a group to come up with what they thought the Sustainable Development Goal should be. Here they are. Okay, goal one, end extreme poverty, including hunger, promote economic growth in decent jobs within planetary boundaries, Ensure effective learning for all children and youth for life and livelihood. Achieve gender equality. Oh, there's a small goal. Social inclusion. There's even a harder goal. Human rights for all. Yeah, right. I'm kidding. I mean, these are really hard goals, right? Uh, achieve health and well-being at all ages. Improve agricultural systems and raise rural prosperity. Empower inclusive productive and resilient cities, curve human-induced climate change, ensure sustainable energy, secure biodiversity, and ensure good management of water, oceans, forests, and natural resources, transform governance and technologies for sustainable development. That's it. Uh, so these, are gonna, the, these will have detailed um, sub-goals, etc. And the, the, like I said, the, the United Nations is finalizing its formulation and it, it has to be voted on and approved by the General Assembly. And, and then they'll adopt them and they'll use them for quite a few years. Uh, they'll be driving a lot of the development agenda. And these, and some cynical people say, oh, what do these matter? But they've mattered. They're, it's pretty clear that this, this setting an agenda like this that the world agrees upon um, matters a lot and uh, people start trying to chip away at the various problems. The, the Millennium Development Goals were not met entirely, okay? But in some respect, some of the goals were met I mean, incredibly well, okay? So some people say, well, don't set a goal you can't meet. Other people say, well, set a goal, start working for it, okay? So it's controversial, but I think um, my personal opinion is I think it's good we set a goal and agenda have, you know, especially when it's broadly agreed upon around the world by experts from all countries, all over the place. I mean, if you can get that kind of agreement, that, that says something about um, how important these things are. Okay, it gives it a lot of validity. If it were one person sitting down or one government setting the agenda, that would be really bad. But when it's this broad, I think it's really good. Okay. Um, questions, comments? Yes? Do you know what type of representative from each country would be at this making or agreeing to these goals? Yes, uh, the African American woman, what's her name? Somebody help me. The, our, our representative, our Susan ambassador Rice. to the UN. Susan Rice. Is it Susan Rice? Yeah, it's, it, she'd be the main. But I suspect she's got, uh, you, you know, anybody like that, <laughs> such a high position, has yeah, staff. She's probably got a whole set of staff, um, experts that are helping her, and in particular, people from the EPA or what, you know, whatever. I, I'm sure I couldn't even name. It, but yeah, they're, <coughs> they're feeding into that, just like other countries would be. So the countries are buying it. 
Well, my understanding of the way this goes is, is you know, they're out, they, uh, I don't know the person, I don't know, they do a vote. I just don't know whether it has to be a majority or two thirds vote or something like that. I don't know the answer to that. I'd like to know, that's a good question. I mean, it might be different than, you know, what we need for Congress or whatever. But yeah, they're trying to get buy-in from everybody. And the, what's funny is that I think the, the way I see the blocks, they're, they're sort of alignments. You know, the developing world's philosophy may align with, e with, with each other. You know, they're like a voting block in a sense. And then um, the OECD is kind of a block, right? And then there's ones in the middle and so forth. Um, but, you know, the U.S. on this, by the way, um, if you go back historically, we've been pretty persnickety. Uh, think of the, uh, what was it, Kobe? No, Kyoto. The Kyoto um, thing that um, I, I, almost every country in the world signed on to, except for the U.S. <laughs> and I think maybe one other dictatorship or something. I mean, so so the U.S. Is, is viewed by many as not having a good track record on all of this, standing standing and saying, you know, the deniers of climate change, the deniers, there's a problem, you know, have fought hard. Um, but Peru was different. I had, didn't have enough time to study it carefully. It was fascinating. Though. They they got more agreement than what they thought they could. Um, so Paris is the people I think are optimistic about what could happen in, at the Paris convention in Paris. Does anybody know when that meeting is? Paris, I think it's either later this year or next year, I forget. Um, these are important events, though, because they're going to drive a lot of what's happening, not just with the environment, because now everybody's realizing we're like, what you do about the environment matters for what you're doing about poverty. It's all stuck together, okay? So it's going to be driving the way we think about humanitarian engineering for many, many years. That's why we have to discuss it. Any other comments? Okay, we're done.